Welcome to Defeat Your Cravings, hosted by Dr. Glenn Livingston, Ph.D. Dr. Glenn is a clinical psychologist and former multi-million dollar consultant to the big food industry and uses his experience to help you defeat your cravings. This show will help you to focus on dramatically reducing cravings and leaving the diet mentality behind so you can more easily and effortlessly achieve your health, fitness, and body composition goals. Please remember, no doctor-patient relationship is created via this show, and you are responsible for confirming any changes to your diet, health, or psychological routines with an appropriately licensed professional before implementing them. Before we get started, if you haven't downloaded the free smartphone app to access dozens of these recordings all in one place, as well as to avail yourself of a confidential community for support, motivation, and assistance, please visit the podcast link on DefeatYourCravings.com as soon as possible. And now, here's your host, Dr. Glenn Livingston. Hey, it's a very good Dr. Glenn Livingston, and I'm here with an amazingly exciting follow-up interview with Russell who at last count had lost about 84 pounds and emailed me the other day that that's up to 101 and he's at goal weight now and just wanted to kind of find out what those last 15, 17 pounds were like, anything else that he's observed about the journey and just get a general follow-up from him and see how things are. So Russell, how are you? Doing good, thanks. I got so much good feedback about your last interview. Oh, great. That's encouraging. Yeah. Talk to me. What happened after last we talked? How did you get the last of the weight off? Was it more of the same? Were there new challenges you encountered? Did you observe anything different? What happened? I guess it would be more of the same. I'm kind of an even keel guy. Yeah, I guess I was about 220 pounds when we talked last and now it's 190. So it's a total weight loss of 110 pounds from the original 300. Oh. To emphasize, I've never counted calories. My poor mother used to do that. And I just cannot make myself do that. What I would do is I would just monitor my weight until it stopped dropping. And once it leveled off or plateaued, I'd introduce the next permanent lifestyle change. That is where my next cut back in food ought to be. And then the weight would start dropping again until the next plateau. I got a laugh because when I got to about 220 pounds, I sort of sarcastically joked with myself, hey, Russell, your daily food intake is perfect for a guy who wants to remain 30 pounds overweight. Oh, <laughs> oh, you don't want to be. Oh, OK, well, in that case, you need to make another cutback. So I'd make another cutback. You're going to laugh. But after I finally leveled out at uh, 190 pounds, I didn't see the need to cut back any further. So I said, I guess this must be maintenance. <laughs> That's funny. So, That's funny. So you've emphasized cutbacks and some people get frightened at that thinking that they'll wind up on something that's too restrictive. Are you feeling boxed in in any way? Do you feel like your plan is too restrictive? Do you feel like it's capable to sustain you long-term? Tell me about that. Yeah, I think one of the things you emphasize a lot, you don't go by your emotions. You don't let them lead. You lead with your intelligence. And bottom line is, is that if I keep eating a certain amount of food and I remain a certain number of pounds overweight, it's objective fact that my body doesn't need that much food energy or calories, if you will. So when I cut back, my mind, the part of me in control knows that any hunger I feel is emotional. My body can't be needing more food because when I eat that food, I'm overweight. So just the knowledge of that is what's got me going. What's a typical day of food look like for you? I kind of cook on Sundays. And that makes my breakfast and lunch for the week. Breakfast is a honey crisp apple that I share with my dog. And um, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I've got a two minute video of our apple ritual. It's really cute. You, you got to uh, send that to me. That's funny. Okay. And then I have my steel cut oats. And then for lunch, I'll have uh, brown rice and black beans that I've cooked on Sunday also besides the oats. And then uh, along with that, half a bag of the romaine salad mix and celery and carrots. I love doing that for myself. Evening is whatever my wife cooks for dinner. She's real good at being health conscious and she makes great food for dinner. On that, the problem is that she cooks too well. So I have to not allow myself to have seconds and basically control that. And then I'll have like a, a cup of uh, frozen fruit, whereas I used to have chocolate. So that's kind of what it is. So you're eating like slow burn grains and beans during the day and a little bit of fruit. And then you're having a more substantial meal at night, whatever your wife cooks, but no seconds right? and a little bit of fruit for dessert. 
Right. Yeah. And I would say, too, you're talking about anything different for the last few pounds, right? I want to know what you've observed. It's the hardest part of the journey for most people to get those last pounds off. I just want to know what you've observed that might be helpful. Like I said, uh, even keeled approach, but I also borrowed something. You know that I've read tons of books and everything over the three-year journey I've been on. One of them was, it's an advanced technique that bodybuilders use when they're preparing for competition. Not that I'm a bodybuilder, but I borrowed their technique for losing those last few stubborn pounds of fat. It's called the zigzag method of carb cycling. And I don't want to misrepresent it. I just have my own version or adaptation of it. So this is what I do, but I'm not claiming that that's the definitive. But okay. For listeners that might not know, we know that if you have a substantive calorie deficit for too long, then the level of the hormone leptin drops too low. And when that happens, the body says, "Uh oh, a famine is coming. So the metabolism slows down. In other words, you burn fewer calories a day so as to conserve body fat. And from a survival perspective, that's a good thing, but I don't want to conserve fat. I want to burn it. So my personal rule of thumb, the way that I apply this principle of the zigzag is I eat with a moderate food deficit and allow myself to feel hunger, but never for more than three days in a row. Hmm. So, so that way the starvation response never kicks in. So for five days a week, I'll try to eat less and experience a little hunger, but on Tuesdays and Fridays, I eat at least my maintenance level of food, actually a little bit more. You know, like I said, I'm not prescribing it for other people. It's known as a short-term tool. And I don't know how much longer I'll keep it up, but I got to tell you, I do it because it's fun for me and I enjoy the rhythm. And I don't ever mind being a little bit hungry because, hey, the next Tuesday or Friday is not that far away. Very interesting. Sounds like that worked for you. Yeah, it, it did great. So anything else psychologically or mindset wise that helped you as you were approaching goal weight? Well, there are a few things. I mean, when you had interviewed me, we had talked and I shared with you that I had a a list of mantras or affirmations and you said, you ought to share them. And I said, oops, I don't have it with me. So I have some of those. Oh, let's do it. People love that. that. Okay, sure, sure. All right. One of them I got from you, actually a lot of them I got from you, but one of them, you told me that this lady worked at a bakery. Here she's working on losing weight and she works at a bakery. But when she would see all that stuff in front of her, she would simply say, not my food. It's just not my food. And Mm -hmm. whenever I see fast food commercials or junk food or sweet type stuff on TV, it's automatic. Now I say not my food or I drive past a place that sells it. I just say not my food. And I don't say it arrogantly like I'm better than someone else who eats it. Not at all. I say it with gratitude because... For 40 years, I struggle with obesity, and it's not part of who I am. I'm free from it, so not my food. There's another trick, too, and I'm going to take the risk of looking stupid since I'm good at that anyway. There's a trick that I use at night because, you know, I I don't eat past 7 or 7.30 p.m., but I go to bed at 1 and get up at 9, so there's more opportunity to get hungry at night when you go to bed later. One of the tricks I used, there's a company called Glee Gum out of Providence, Rhode Island. They make all natural chewing gum and they have a sugar-free gum that has no aspartame. And what I'll do is I'll choose that at night and I'll also eat ice. And, And this is dorky, but I'll break a piece of ice off with my teeth and then with my tongue, I'll wrap the gum around it and then crunch down on it. And it kind of brings back the flavor and it's, it's satisfying, you know? It's, it's really something. interesting. I never heard that before. It's corny, but you know, it, it's satisfying. And I do it while I'm watching a video or something like that. So you're entitled to have your name in that technique if you want to. Uh, no, that's okay. Just call it the corny gum technique. When I do feel the hunger, I just say emptiness and my stomach leads to fullness in my life. Ooh, I say that too. Oh, awesome. And then there's a third one. There's more fun and pleasure in life than what I put in my mouth. Because, you know, I grew up like food is the only pleasure I get, you know, which is kind of pitiful and self-pity. It's like Jesus said, life is more than food, for crying out loud. Mm. I borrowed this from a couple of sources and put them together, the two different phrases. But exercise is an aging body's best friend. Muscle is the true fountain of youth. That is really true. I found to be true. And then there's another one, just a background real briefly, is sometimes you're tempted to eat more or allow yourself to eat too much. And the reason is because you know you're about to have a workout or you just got done working out. I realized when I did that, that I was overestimating 
how many calories an individual workout burns. So this is kind of a saying that has two sub parts to it. While exercise is necessary, imperative for physical fitness, for fat loss, I put my faith only in dietary self-control, eating fewer calories. And the sub points are exercise and individual workout burns far fewer calories than we think. And secondly, we do not need to eat as much as we think. I need far fewer calories a day than I've always believed. So I've continually reviewed that so that I don't put my hope in exercise, but in controlling my eating when it comes to fat loss. And that's been really helpful. That's really great, Russell. That's really helpful. The mantra that helped me with that was that you can't outrun a bad diet. (laughs) I love it. I love it. I didn't make it up. I've heard that elsewhere, but you- yeah, the, the, the version that I heard is you can't outrun your fork. <laughs> yeah. I used to hike a um, 6,000 foot mountain and I figured I could eat 10,000 calories ah. and, and I really couldn't. I would gain weight those weeks. That's exactly it. I got to tell you, the last one of these is it's not really fair to call it a mantra because it's too wordy, but it's sort of an affirmation. And I hear you often use the phrase at peace with food. And I was trying to write down and capture, and I struggled to find the words, what does it mean to me to be at peace with food? And this is just what I wrote. I realize now that I never again need to fear burning out or giving up. That fear came from the old dieting mindset that said, quote, I'm expending unnatural amounts of energy to do something contrary to my nature, something I hate. And if the payoff isn't big enough or doesn't happen fast enough, I quit, unquote. But what I've done, I've made small, gradual, incremental, yet permanent lifestyle and identity changes. I am a man who eats only whole natural foods. And the amount of food I eat per day is normal for a 190 pound man my size. I haven't gone on something like a diet only to go off of it when I burn out. I now eat and exercise the way I most deeply want to. So I'm not expending great energy doing something I hate. I'm expending normal energy living a lifestyle that I love. I'm relaxed. I'm at peace with food. Love that. That's fantastic. That's awesome. It's longer winded, but when you review it, it it helps you think more clearly. One of the more advanced tricks that I have, which I don't really teach publicly, and I'm going to be teaching it in the courses, but I don't teach publicly because it's a little more work and people get scared of it. One of the more advanced tricks is to write out the entirety of a squeal, the full refutation of that squeal, and then the mantra that encapsulates that squeal, which you just really went through. And then I record that for myself and I have the document with the categories of the worst squeals that my pig would give me and their refutations and mantras. And I made a recording of that for myself. It's about 17 minutes long. And I listen to it periodically. Like you can't quite do it every day. I mean, I guess you could, but I don't really need to. You listen to it periodically and it just solidifies the refutation in your mind so that the pig just can't use that anymore. It just can't. Russell, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions, if that's okay. Sure. Okay, so you said that exercise is an aging body's best friend and muscle is the true fountain of youth. Could you tell me a little bit more about your experience with that? What does that feel like in your body? How do you know that? How do you know that it's the true fountain of youth? What's that like? What I've done is I've come up with a body weight cardio workout that's fun for me and I love it. And it's so it's easy to sustain. And as you know, I put it in a pass honorable form so I can share it with others. I believe I emailed it to you a while back. I guess the thing about it is it's my strong belief and conviction that it should never be about just fat loss. People want to lose weight. The goal should be overall good health. The muscles were designed to be solid, have strong muscle tone. Our bodies should be that way. So the goal isn't merely fat loss, but optimum physical fitness, true overall health, athleticism. But if you're going to realistically sustain exercise for the rest of your life, you've got to choose something you love. And that's what I did for the body weight cardio. And because I have problems with my knees, at least I have in the past, uh, I haven't lately. I got a mat that's like two and a half inches thick. I'll do running in place or different type exercises. There's a variety of them so that it doesn't hurt my knees. And I can tell when it's been a good workout, I'll tell my family it's a killer cardio, but I love it. I can feel in my body after the workout that I do feel that I've definitely had some exercise, but I don't feel like I'm hurting and struggling. I feel like stimulated and excited. 
taken a shower with gusto and I just feel more alive. And then afterwards, I just notice that I don't tire easily. I have a spring in my step, you know, pep in your step kind of thing, stamina. It's just so much more than the number of pounds of body fat you're carrying or the percent your body composition. Because our bodies really support our spirit, right? Yeah, yeah. Could you talk a little bit about the journey? Because you lost 110 pounds. And I imagine if you picked up 110 pounds on your shoulders and tried to do your body weight (laughs) workout, that would be death right now. So how did you start with this? That's a really good question, Glenn. I really believe in body weight exercise more so than barbells and machines and stuff like that. I think that body weight gives you the balance and skill and coordination where it's true athleticism. And books that I've read, one or two of them really stand out as the best. You use at least six different principles to have either regressions or progressions. Regressions is when you make the exercise easier. Progression is when you make it harder. One of the principles, just as an example, is leverage. So when I was at 300 pounds, there's no way I could do a regular push-up, right? But what I would do is I would have this bar that was maybe, say, three feet off the floor, and I would put my hands on the bar and I would do push-ups, but at an inclination, you know, my chest would go down and touch the bar and come back up. And you can do it with a chair if you want to, you know what I'm saying? Your feet are on the floor and your hands are on a chair, for example. So you have that leverage. And then as you get stronger and you lose weight, you can do something lower like a footstool. And then maybe eventually you can do floor push-ups. And then when you get even stronger, you can keep your hands on the floor and elevate your feet. Okay. So leverage is just one method of about six or so that you can use to adjust the difficulty level of the exercise. You read some good books that told you how to do this incrementally so that you weren't overwhelmed and exhausted. Because I work with a lot of people that are 100 pounds or more overweight, and I find that getting them to start exercise is really hard because it's very uncomfortable for them. I remember a guy who weighed 500 pounds. Just getting him to walk around the block was, was a big deal. That's really helpful. You learned how to use leverage and do some things that were really easy for you to start with. And then you work your way up to it. Yeah, there was a martial arts artist I knew one time, and he had a good saying. He said, do what you can and don't do what you can't. Certainly someone who's got a lot to lose, like I did, would want to get a doctor's approval and stuff like that, you know, to be wise about their body. But I always had a rule of thumb where I'd err on the side of doing too little rather than too much. Because if you get a sports injury, then you're out of commission for a while. Yeah. Yeah. And also if you make the workout too uncomfortable, then you're not going to want to do it. Yeah. But if you make it just comfortable enough, you know, it's a strain, but it's just comfortable enough so that you get a bit of the exercise high, you feel that spring in your step and you feel alive when you're taking the shower with gusto but you're not dreading the next time you have to do it. And and Glenn, that's exactly what I, when I was reading that little phrase about being at peace with food, when I said, I'm not expending unnatural amounts of energy to do something I hate. One of the two things I was thinking of besides eating healthy food that some people hate is exercise. And somehow you have to reprogram your mind so that you love what is good and healthy for the body and you love moving your body. So yeah, exactly. Lovely. Russell, what's it like to be 110 pounds thinner? What does that feel like? You know, I was joking with my wife and daughter. I don't know that it's fully hit me yet. It's like looking in the mirror and looking so fat and everything for decades. It's who I am now that I lost the weight. When I was 300 pounds, I would close my office door so no one could hear me. And one of the affirmations that I would read is I am a lean, healthy man. That's who I am. Identity based affirmations powerful. But if anyone had heard me say that, they would have laughed me out of the room, you know? That's funny because I used to say, I am becoming a lean, clean Marine. Ah, <laughs> a I'm lean, clean, a... fat burning machine. <laughs> no, <laughs> a lean, clean, fat burning machine. I love it. Do you still see the fat guy when you look in the mirror? I would say not totally, but I don't know that the change has fully sunk in yet. I'd have to say Every six months to a year at a new weight, people start to develop a new identity. It seems like identity change lags behind actual change six months to a year in my experience. Mm. What does your wife think? She's happy for me. She's been supportive all along. But I mean, it must be different for her to put her arms around a 300-pound guy as opposed to a 200-pound <laughs> guy, right? 190-pound oh, right. guy. 
Right. Uh, yeah, I, I would say so. I think she's happy with with that. And, you know, it's comical because when we were in our early dating and, and marriage, I told her that I had a problem with putting on weight. And when I'm out of the Air Force and I'm not being forced, I could put on a lot of weight. And she looked at me and said, Russell, I'd love you if you weighed 300 pounds. Well, uh -oh. guess, guess, uh -oh. <laughs> guess, guess how much I got up to. <laughs> Yeah, she didn't know what she was saying. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. I know. Oh it's almost a prophecy in the bad sense. <laughs> I guess she does love you, though. Yeah, she's stuck with me. She's put up with me. What about your daughter? Yeah, it's so funny. She's 23 years old now. We adopted her and our son from Guatemala in 1999 when they were each eight months old. And what's funny is she has never known me until recently when I've lost that weight. Previously, she had never known me as anything but obese. So it's an adjustment for her too, because she never knew me any other way. I always weighed at least 275. My uncle shaved his beard for the first time and I said, who is this guy? Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. What's it like to be 110 pounds thinner at work, 110 pounds thinner when you're walking around town? What's that like? At work, I'd have to say not noticeable, I teach at Texas State Technical College in Waco, and they're making it so that if you teach an academic type course, not something that's a hands-on technology, you work remotely. At home, I don't notice much, but I'd say around town, I say great, because I always walk fast anyway, but now I just feel the energy, you know, just surging, and I have a quick pace. It just feels really freeing. Do people treat you any differently? That's a good one. I think it's like you said, Glenn, they were probably friendly and kind all along, but you are more aware of it when you felt better about yourself and you had lost weight. I don't know if they're much different, but I, I guess I appreciate them more. Yeah. Is there anything that you wanted to share that I didn't ask you about? There are a few things that I prepared, and I'll tell you why. I've kept like a three or four inch, maybe four inch thick binder of notes over the last three years. And I looked at everything that I had been learning and journaling about since our last interview to look at some big things. And there are a few things. I think one of them was that eliminating those hyper palatable foods makes the party with food a thing of the past. And you know, that resonated with me because I had that realization, but I hadn't put it into words. But one of the things you've said is moving your food decisions from your impulses to your intellect, eating by design, not by impulse. I've just noticed that I don't have a problem eating whole natural foods on impulse, but the processed garbage with the unnaturally high concentrations of sugar, fat, starch, salt, all that junk, I used to crave and eat those on impulse. I don't think food addiction really existed on the Savannah. I don't think that fag was sitting by the cave with Wilma saying, oh my God, eat too much berries, eat too much mammoth. It's an artifact of our industrial processed food society. I totally agree. And I never fully understood that till more recently. And another thing about that too, as far as eating by design and not impulse is a planned weekly snack. You had talked about something called variable ratio reinforcement, which engenders addiction. And you illustrated with slot machines. You said you feel driven to keep playing that slot machine because this could be the time I win. This could be it. And I don't want to miss out in case it is. And whenever you reward the impulse, the addiction grows. But what if the game was fixed and not variable? What if every seven times you played, you lost the first six times and you won on the seventh time? Once that happened, consistently, you wouldn't be addicted anymore. So if we eat by design and not impulse, I plan a special snack once a week, Friday nights after dinner, but I have to be finished by 730. Then I don't crave it the rest of the time because I know Friday is coming. It's like a pressure release valve for me. And I eat it on my terms, not on the pig's terms. And that's the only time that you go to the slot machine because you know that's the only time that it's loaded. Exactly. Exactly. That's been really powerful. I always joke about the Apostle Peter because he had to hear everything three times before it sunk in. He has that pattern. I'm a little bit worse. I, I have to hear it 300 times. You know, I know you talk about, I am not the pig. We call the, the pig or food demon the source of those unnatural cravings and destructive food behaviors. But I guess I understand it better than I did before. It just gets more deep with me that the human taste buds were designed to love food that's natural, but our taste buds and survival drives have been corrupted by industry to create these man-made products with these high concentrations of sugar, salt, fat, all that. 
but my rational mind can understand this and then take rightful authority over what I choose to eat. Those corrupted cravings are not the desires of the real me. I can fully separate myself from them. And now I see that fueling my body with healthy foods is what I truly want to do, not something I have to do. It's kind of like you keep sharing this truth and you try to reach as many people as you can, but not everybody understands that they can do it. I know this is naive, but I believe anyone can do it if they're adequately motivated, but few people realize that you really can transform your beliefs and your taste buds preferences. It may take just a matter of weeks, but you can reprogram your, your taste buds and your beliefs and love whole natural foods because of that natural neuroplasticity in your brain. Even lifelong mindsets of what you used to call comfort food, they can be changed, reprogrammed. That's very well said, Russell. Do you remember the moment when you first started to believe that was true? Was there a moment that you ate your nectarine or took a bite of an apple or enjoyed the smell of your basil on your salad or something? Do you remember a moment when that happened? You know, I don't remember a moment very well, but I believe it was like when I bit into a honey crisp apple. And I just remember this is a delicious creation of God, of nature. And I remember when I, when I used to eat all these candies and chocolate bars and all that stuff that was part of my past and donuts and pastries, an apple couldn't possibly compete with that stuff that's chemically designed to hyper stimulate your taste buds and hit your bliss points. But once you stop eating that unnatural stuff, it's delicious. I think one bodybuilder wrote that fruit is nature's candy. Yeah, I remember eating a honey crisp apple and, and thinking that. So, but I don't remember when it was or anything okay. at the moment. But it's just amazing when we eat what we're meant to eat, you know, like like you say, Jack LaLanne remember him, a uh, fitness and, and a health guru and nutrition guru from back in the day, he used to say, if man makes it, don't eat it. Yeah, if it's got a label on it. <laughs> yeah, uh, he was funny. One of his sayings was, I can't die. That would be bad for my image. <laughs> <laughs> I used to want to be Jack Willen when I was a kid. He, he was the guy who swam across the English Channel tugging any boats filled with people or something oh, like that. Oh, man, I know. I he, know. He, he, he was amazing. He was amazing. He was. He was. Um, is there anything I missed? Anything that I should have asked you that I didn't ask you? You know, the only thing else I would say that I would emphasize and is one of the major things that's been helpful for me is I truly understand that I can remain free from binging on pig slop, even when there's a lot of stress or pain in my life. During a time like when you're afraid or stressed, the pig is saying, you deserve a reward because you're having a hard day or difficult season of life. The fact is, it, it's true, I do deserve a reward, but I no longer reward myself by harming my body. When times are tough, that's all the more reason to be healthy so I can be there for my family. Exactly. You want to ask yourself, what would abstaining from this indulgence, how would that make me a happier, better person at this time? You want to link it to the person you're trying to become. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have one last question for you. Sure. What does your dog think? Oh, <laughs> You know what? I would have to say my dog's thoughts have not changed because there's something about dogs that loves you unconditionally and irrevocably, no matter who you are or what you've done. They're the same way. Exactly. I'll have exactly. to send you that two minute video on the, the I want to see it. I want to see it. <laughs> Any last pending thoughts for people who are struggling? There's something about the fellowship of people who, who are on your side and have been through what you're going through you don't feel alone. They really do understand what it's like. So keep on keeping on and reach out if we can help you. Terrific. Thank you, Russell, very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. And that brings us to the end of today's broadcast of Defeat Your Cravings, hosted by Dr. Glenn Livingston. If you'd like to find out more about the products and services Dr. Glenn offers to help you dramatically reduce your cravings and stop overeating in 90 days or less, please visit DefeatYourCravingsCoaching.com. That's DefeatYourCravingsCoaching.com. Thanks.